All right, moving on to public safety, judicial, and labor. Let's see if we can't get through this in the next hour, 15 minutes. We'll take our break at 2 o'clock and return to the floor. And if by chance we don't finish this section, then we could come back conceivably around 3, finish it up. But I think all of us need further briefing to move any further. So this will be the last section we'll get to today. Page one is in the judicial branch and has to do with dependency council caseload ratios. Very important issue. Hello. Anita Lee with the Legislative Analyst Office. The governor's office did not have a proposal related to this. Um, the Senate and the Assembly both augmented um, the amount of funds for dependency council by 33 million. For context, currently we're providing approximately 104 million towards dependency council. Um, the difference is trailer bill language. The Senate also approved trailer bill language that would um, impose uh, uh, put in place maximum caseload ratios related to pendency council. Um, for, from our perspective in our analysis, we would recommend going with the assembly version. We think that in the trailer bill language, it is unclear whether the specified ratios are appropriate and there could be future costs related to the ratios as well. All right, thank you, Ms. Lee. On that point, I appreciate your position, but I think the reason for our trailer bill language was so that we don't lose our way again because the caseloads are so outrageous now. We have to do something to improve the situation, but could we design some trailer bill language that would meet your concerns? Uh, clearly, we'd have to invest some time in determining what a reasonable range of ratio might be, but there probably should be something in there. Oh, we'll be back here again a few years from now and we won't have actually addressed the problem. We'll just have put a Band-Aid on it. So we do think that this is a policy decision for the legislature. When we say that we're, when it's unclear about the ratios, we would note, for example, that some of the ratios that were determined were determined in 2008, um, and there's work that is currently happening at, at Judicial Council with their staff in terms of determining what ratios are appropriate. And so we just wanted to kind of bring that before you in terms of you might want to um, include that in your policy discussions. How bad is the situation these days? I'm hearing hundreds and hundreds of caseloads per per dependency council? It varies from county to county. There are some counties that are much worse off than others. Um, so, you know, you have some that are actually below the, the, the proposed ratios, but there are others that are much higher. And so, um, for example, the higher ratio, if you have, if the attorney has the assistance of a social worker or an investigator as right. well, is one to 188. And there are some um, estimates where there are some counties that are one to 200, maybe one to 300 as well. What counties are those? Uh, I would have to get back to you on that. We do have that information, but I think I would have to get back to you. I can show you LA is one of them. Quite possibly. And the caseload ratios, I'm sure, have been going up in the years since we have been cutting the judiciary branch so significantly. Um, yes. So previously, uh, previously, I'm sorry, let me just back up. Sure. Related to the judicial branch budget, there are very few kind of line items for specific purposes. So for example, in the judicial branch budget, you'll have line items for court interpreters, for example. Um, related to trial court operations, there's a lot more discretion in terms of where they put their money. This was one of those items that they had discretion. The judicial branch has pretty much consistently been giving them approximately 104 million. Um, the workload has kind of fluctuated. There was a slight dip, but then it has also been coming back up on a statewide basis. And so um, one of the actions that both houses kind of agreed on is that in this Budget Act, those $104 million would be pulled apart as kind of a separate budget item, essentially to lock in those funds. Thank you. Uh and I recognize, and I saw Ms. Bosler nodding her head when you said that uh, th these uh, funds come from discretionary pool. Uh, discretion is a good thing uh, if you've got money to make decisions about spending. And we have cut over a billion dollars from this branch. And so it's nice to say that they have discretion, but without funds, <laughs> they're not going to be able to cover all of their needs. So. Uh, I just want to share a brief story. Uh, we have 
uh, the opportunity to be shadowed by a foster youth every year, and I know many of us do that. And I had a young woman who was my shadow this past year. She's now in her early 20s. She's one of the few success stories, and she's working in the field herself, helping other young people go through what she went through. And I'll spare you the details of her particular situation, but what she told me in some conversations we had that through all the turmoil of her teen years, that there were many adults in her life, but that she didn't feel like she could trust any of them. In fact, she used the term, this term exactly, that everyone had their own agendas. The one person she could trust was her attorney. And that stayed with me. And uh, that these attorneys who are doing such important work and they're modestly paid, they are seriously modestly paid. Do you happen to have a range of what? I do not, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's a, a fraction of what they could be making uh, in the private sector. That young lives are really dependent upon them and to the degree that they are overloaded with cases, they can't do the job that they're giving their lives to do. So I've got a very soft spot in my heart for the work that they do and are making sure that they've got the funds that they need. Uh, Ms. Bosler. <laughs> Uh, this is an issue we have been looking at for um, uh, many months now, and I do want to recognize the, the um, work that the Judicial Council has done um, on its Trial Court Budget Advisory Committee to look at the allocation of the existing monies uh, to ensure that even more inequities um, are not uh, continued uh, by, the, by the, just the allocation of the funds among the different courts. And so we wanted to recognize the work that they've done to, to modify uh, the allocation methodology uh, to try and uh, reduce the disparities uh, between uh, courts. Uh, and then also, I just wanted to, to follow up uh, on what the LAO said. Uh, we're concerned about the trailer bill language um, and, and locking in something that will uh, cause increased costs in future years. And then on the on the dollar amounts, um, we recognize and we've been following this issue for a few years, uh, but are just concerned about the overall uh, commitment of general fund resources that they can be sustained over the long term, and uh, so uh, would have to continue to to work on a final budget package on whether there's money for this purpose. Very good, uh, Senator Laura. Thank you. Let me uh, put my effort in to try to. Back to TBL, the trailer bill language. You know, you're absolutely, the ILO is absolutely right. In uh, the caseload for some counties, over 300, way above the judicial council standards. And, you know, as we look at um, the cost, the potential cost increases, we also have to look at the cost of the outgoing cost of what happens to these children uh, if they don't have proper representation. And in LA, I can tell you it's a hot mess. Uh, and, and these children are our children. There's, it's just up to us, the state of California, to take the responsibility for these kids, uh, and we have that duty to protect them. And so I understand that there's outgoing costs, but we have to look at the ongoing cost of what happens to the child. And I know I get the, the issue of it being a policy discussion, but as we're, we move forward about trying to address such an important issue that's going to have long-term consequences to not only this individual, but to our overall state budget, I think it behooves us to look at this trailer bill language and set some standards because it is trying to avoid um, a place where we are where we are at now. Uh, and so I think maybe there's some a place where we can get some compromise. But this is a, a very important issue for us in LA County. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Assemblyman Bloom. Uh, as somebody who has uh, spent a limited amount of time, but some time uh, 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 working inside the uh, dependency court system, uh, I want to echo the, the, the comments that we've heard, and I think uh, um, the term hot mess that uh, Senator Lara used for uh, um, the LA dependency court, it's actually one of the, the most well-run courts, but it is, um, you really have to spend some time there to appreciate it, that's all, all, all I can say. Um, and uh, we do have to focus on the uh, customers that we that we serve uh, in the dependency court and the social and economic consequences if we don't properly serve um, this population of children who every one of them fit the definition of at-risk youth. They're at risk for substance abuse. They're at risk for homelessness. They're at risk for incarceration. So the social and economic costs that we uh, uh, that, that they 
bear as individuals and that we bear as a society and the economic costs as well are uh, uh, well deserving of our attention before that happens. I just want to clarify, I said the hot mess was the caseloads for the attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Page two is additional trial court judges. Issue we've been talking about for quite a while. I think going back a few years, we was it a, then Assemblyman Jones who created, I think, 50 additional judgeships maybe eight, 10 years ago. Um, I can't remember the specific member, but uh, there, were, there were two kind of two stages. Um, in 2006, the legislature uh, authorized and appropriated funds for 50 new judgeships. In 2007, an additional 50 judgeships were authorized, but no funds were appropriated right. for them since then. Um, and I'll continue just to introduce sure, the item. Ahead. And so the governor and the assembly had no proposal um, related to this issue. The Senate added $10 million from the general fund for 12 additional trial court judges. These um, judgeships would be assigned based on need. Um, and so in our analysis, we thought that the proposed funding would go to support kind of the legislature's previous actions um, related to the authorization of the 50 new judgeships. And it would also help address some of the existing workload issues that the legislature has been considering as well. Um, but we did think that you would want to weigh this against your other budget priorities, given that it is a commitment of general fund dollars. Sure. All right. Ms. Bosler. Uh, We've, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, the Judicial Council over the last two years and have restored uh, $355 million over the past two years, th this year and then in this upcoming budget, uh, to uh, ensure uh, that the, the branch is uh, working efficiently um, and also uh, maintaining access to justice. And I'll just note that uh, the the uh, the Chief Justice has started um, on their commission on the future of California court system, uh, which is a, a widespread or wide-ranging um, effort to modernize and evaluate trial court operations um, and improve areas uh, and increase efficiency and also improve access to justice. And so we do not support the Senate's uh, proposal at this time. We think that that commission uh, should uh, uh, do their work and then report back uh, to the legislature and to the administration when their work is complete about um, what uh, additional modifications uh, may be needed. Thank you. Page three has to do with those incompetent to stand trial. Drew Soderborg, Legislative Analyst's Office. So the administration has a three-part proposal to uh, address the current wait list of individuals who have been found incompetent to stand trial. Uh, specifically, the governor proposes $17 million from the general fund for 105 additional IST beds in existing state hospitals, $3.6 million from the general fund for preliminary plans and working drawings for a cap outlay proposal that would secure 505 beds at uh, DSH Metropolitan, 232 of which would represent new capacity that would be earmarked for IST patients, and finally, $10.1 million from the general fund to expand the restoration of competency program, which provides restoration services in county jails in the community. This would provide about roughly around 58 additional beds that haven't been funded previously. Uh, the administrator, uh, excuse me, the assembly approved this proposal as budgeted. The Senate approved the proposal to increase capacity at DSH Metropolitan. Um, the Senate, however, did not approve the proposal to activate 105 beds, existing beds, and DSH facilities. Instead, the Senate elected to expand the restoration of competency program by six million more than was uh, requested by the administration, and this would result in uh, up to 108 additional <coughs> restoration of competency beds. Uh, from our office's perspective, we would recommend going with the Senate approach because expanding the restoration of competency program represents a more cost-effective way to address the the uh, IST waitlist. I should also mention the Senate also approved placeholder trailer bill language that would seek to streamline the expansion of the restoration of competency program at the county level. And because of the possibility that it would help expedite the expansion, we would also recommend uh, approval of that trailer bill language. Thank you, Mr. Soderberg. I think the Senate 
proposal actually was recommended by the LAO. That is correct. It was right. consistent with our sure. recommendation. So, colleagues, if we might just take a minute, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Soderberg, if you could give us some additional information. I just met with uh, the Sheriff's Association when they were in town a week or so ago. And if you're not familiar with this ROC program, which is the Restoration of Competency program, if you could talk to us about it, as I understand, uh, counties, meaning sheriffs in those counties, have the opportunity, if they have individuals who are incompetent, stand trial, uh, given that there is a waiting list to get into our state facility, and that's why the governor's proposed what he has, that those individuals will sit in county jail as they await those beds, that is on the county's dime. But if they enter into our res uh, restoration of competency program, yeah. then the state will cover that cost for community treatment setting. And you're telling us that you have information that suggests, suggests that we actually get better results at the county level. And sometimes, and I'll quiet down, you can tell us more, uh, it may be managing medication treatments a little bit better and giving them some additional treatment so that they don't have to go to the state bed at $250,000 a year. So you want to take it from there? Yeah, absolutely. The restoration of competency program has been shown to be very effective, um, particularly in regard to cost. So you're correct. Oftentimes, additional IST beds can cost over $200,000 per year. In contrast, the restoration of competency program typically costs between ninety dollars and just over $100,000 per year. Part of the reason that there's a difference between the two is because the restoration of competency program is really targeted for individuals who are relatively easy uh, to restore. So um, by uh, targeting those individuals before they need to get transferred to the state hospitals, it, you can uh, effectively treat more patients more rapidly through the program. And out of our 58 counties, am I correct, only two counties are participating in the ROC program, which is the reason for the Treor Bill language to streamline the process because we want to get more counties in. It's more cost effective. We get better results. And I think San Bernardino is not Riverside? or That's correct. Those two counties. Uh, so how do we streamline the program to encourage more counties to get into it? Clearly there's already an ince a financial incentive for them to get in, but despite the financial incentive, they're still not doing so. Why is that? Um, it's difficult to say. I think it varies county to county. One of the issues that could potentially be addressed going forward is that a lot of jails lack space to operate the programs. However, going forward with the passage of Prop 47, there should be additional jail capacity. That could address some of it. However, there have been um, issues that have been identified in the uh, negotiation process between DSH and the counties. For example, there's been disagreements over who's responsible for what costs. So some of the options that are being considered is trying to delineate clearly in statute who is responsible for what costs. But I think at this point, the specifics of uh, what changes could be made to expedite the process are still being worked out. How long is our current waiting list to get into the hospital beds? Um, right now, it is right about 300. 300. Okay. Ms. Bosler. Yes, uh, we do uh, support the assembly position here, uh, which is the governor's May revision position, and we do absolutely support expanding the ROC program, which is why we added another $10 million, uh, to that program in the May revision. And we are in active conversations with many counties, but some counties um, are just uh, don't have the space in their, in their jail. Um, one of the areas where we've had very... Um, uh, uh, specific conversations uh, is with the um, LA Superior Court. Uh, they are very concerned about the time it takes to get IST patients out of the local county jail in, in LA into a state hospital bed and um, have been uh, uh, concerned about it for some time and have, have, have increased their concern in recent months and are even uh, considering uh, loving, loving significant penalties on the state, uh, daily uh, penalties, uh, if we don't uh, move quickly uh, to uh, find solutions to move uh, IST patients uh, into uh, uh, either a rock bed or into a state hospital bed. So uh, either way, we can avoid the penalties. We, we want to avoid the penalties. No, yeah, I know yeah, we want yeah, to avoid the penalties, cost. but by taking either route, we can avoid yes, the penalties. Yes, um, you know, I think there, there are bed. additional hurdles, um, so, sometimes uh, political hurdles, of moving an IST patient from one county to another county. Um, uh, state hospitals, these, these are, um, the, the restoration of competency is a state responsibility. 
Uh, so uh, uh, their assumption is that the state is is going to take care of, of it. Um, and so uh, our, our proposal did have a multi-pronged approach, as uh, Mr. Soderberg mentioned, uh, to include you know, expanding rock beds to the extent that we can, and we absolutely want to do more of that, but also activating some um, additional beds within our state hospital system so that we can take take um, more of the IST patients into the state hospital and start the restoration of competency um, process. Uh, the other thing I will note is that the secure uh, perimeter at the Metropolitan, which says in your agenda, adding 505 beds, that's going to be in a multi-year process to get that um, secure perimeter uh, in place, and that's really going to to help with ISTs, but also going to help more broadly with our uh, mentally disordered defender uh, population as well. These are patients that we have to have behind a secure per perimeter. So that's really a much broader proposal that's um, that does help with us with ISTs, but also um, uh, helps uh, with our changing mental health population at the state hospitals. Uh, so we think this is a, a, a very important proposal, uh, and we do think it's balanced, uh, and we do uh, absolutely continue to uh, be very interested in expanding the ROC, the ROC programs. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Soderberg in a moment to comment on my question to you. Uh, the Senate proposal is actually to save over $11 million from the governor's proposal. and. If, as you said, we can avoid the penalties by dealing with this waiting list, either getting them into a state bed at $250,000 a year or into the county rock program at about $100,000 a year, either will solve our problem of waiting list. Why would we not want to save over $11 million in infrastructure costs and save $150,000 per individual and resolve the problem, and likely, as Mr. Soderberg said, there are lower level cases that don't need the 250,000. Why not invest, rather than expanding the 250,000 dollar per year beds, into the less expensive program at the county where we get better results? Why would we not want to do that? I think we I think we have concerns about being able to achieve that, and I, and I because I we're a very long ways from every county having a rock program. Um, we are talking to any counties that are that are interested, but some counties like Los Angeles um, do not feel that they have the space uh, to dedicate to this program. So the Is that pre or post Prop Forty Seven. It's been it's been in current in current discussions that we've had okay. with the with the sheriffs. Uh, and the other thing is that some of these cases um, are more appropriate for a state hospital setting, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, that that is, that would be the preference of the county. In the same breath, you would say there are some that are more appropriate for the county. Well, I think that the, the difference in the performance is is uh, resulting in that there are lower acuity cases that have stayed in uh, the county jails and have. Uh, and the contractors have, who have um, done the restoration um, have been successful, and that's a good thing. And that certainly will save the state money, and, and we uh, support that and want to continue to expand that. Um, but there are some cases that are much more difficult. There's a wide range, um, and uh, the state hospitals may be the best, the best place um, for that restoration of competency uh, process to, uh, to, to, to be um, administered. Uh, so, I mean, I think I think we need both uh, is uh, is our concern. I agree. Uh, I agree. And uh, we're very concerned about uh, being able to completely uh, address the waiting list issue, because this is also a county by county issue. And there are some counties that may be very fine with uh, taking on an IST bed uh, for their own. IST patient uh, um, inmate from their own county, but very reluctant to take one from another county. Uh, that's you know that's not going to be across the board. Some counties may be very fine with that. They do have a financial incentive, as you said, uh, but uh, uh, we're concerned about being able to implement that in a timely manner in the budget year. And the urgency is really now. Uh, we, we have a lot of counties and a lot of courts uh, who have been concerned about this issue uh, for, for many years, but it has become more acute in recent months. Yeah. Uh, so I have heard at that meeting with the sheriffs that there is talk of working regionally. Uh, Marin County is going to partner with San Francisco or San Mateo, so some of these regional 
uh, projects can move forward. So, uh, Mr. Soderberg, your response to uh, Ms. Bosler's comments. Absolutely. So right now we have very few rock beds in the system. I believe it's only about 40 in San Bernardino and Riverside. So if from our perspective, it's highly likely that there are many individuals who are currently in the state hospitals who, had there been a sufficient rock capacity, could have been serviced at the local level. So while it is absolutely true that there are individuals who couldn't be serviced by the rock program, by expanding it, we can ensure that individuals who are eligible can stay at the local level and free up beds at the state level for individuals who can't be treated by rock. And I'd also like to note that DSH has been working with counties for quite a long period of time now to expand um, the rock program. So just because uh, we don't have a, a full expansion yet, talks have been underway with counties like Alameda, Sacramento, and other counties, and they've been underway for quite a while. So it's possible, particularly if the legislature were to approve the TBL, that we could see the fruits from those discussions. So while the initial expansion took quite a long time and extensive negotiations, some negotiations have already been underway, and we may be close to getting additional beds um, in new counties right. in, in the near future. That LA County is or is about to be part drained with San Bernardino? My understanding is, is that LA was partnering with San Bernardino on some of this new expansion, but I would defer to uh, finance for clarity on that. No, I know that um, Teresa Calvert with Department of Finance, that LA has been working with Department of State Hospitals and in discussions with San Bernardino, which is um, the assumption behind part of our $10 million for uh, 76 additional beds in San Bernardino. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on. Uh, I know. Uh, no, I was just going to simply say, I think uh, our. Our concern is probably reflected in the governor's proposal with regards to uh, having strong support for ROC and believing that ROC obviously is a is a is an excellent way to go and, and may meet those needs. But we are conscious of the fact of the backlog. Our folks are constantly being informed of the two three hundred people who are in the state who can't uh, we can't move them into a bed to, to develop competency and then as as a result get them the kind of justice that they need. And so that's a, a real concern and whether or not we could gear up enough rock in a time to basically reduce this list is questionable. So that was the reason for our proposal was we felt it was a two-prong approach, not just, you know, that we wanted to make sure that we had some beds that were there because of the waiting list, but also the fact that uh, encouraged those who are going to develop rock to do that. And we know that they've been working a while and we still only have two counties. Uh, in the state after the time of, of working and negotiating and, and whether or not if we put more money in it may not necessarily produce the results we want and then we're still short in terms of beds and, and trying to get folks into the hospitals or the services they need so they can then develop the competency to go. So I think we're in this kind of funny position where we know uh, probably what we want in the end but in the interim you know we have to begin to respond to this waiting list of 400 and some odd people who need to be placed somewhere. Uh, and uh, and to respond to that while we build out for the, the capacity for rock in the various areas uh, and to see what the local areas are saying if they have the ability to do that. Um, some question whether or not if we get the money, some of the states, counties still may not be able to do it because they don't have either the ability, the capacity to gear up as quickly for the program in terms of what they're experiencing. So we don't really have all the data. I think at this point that we need to be able to say we can abandon the, the beds and simply go in one direction. So ours is the two prong approach in that, and for that reason. And so we'll we'll move on. But um, Mr. Soderberg, you think we could resolve our waiting lists and threat of fines by investing further in rock and not building out new beds? We, we took a look at this, and we, when uh, this came up as part of the May revision, part of the reason we also didn't recommend uh, approving the full 105 beds is because the need for some of those beds was premised on the assumption that there would be an increase in the number of referrals. And when we looked at the data, we saw that referral rates had gone up and down in recent months, and so it wasn't clear to us that there would be the increase. And so while it's, uh, you know, clearly we couldn't guarantee that the wait list would be fully serviced by the beds, we think that um, it's, it's a definite possibility. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, to be continued, mm -hmm. given that we're arguing mm -hmm. over a few million here and a few million there for libraries and other things that are near and dear mm -hmm. to our hearts, to me the idea of spending 11 million in additional dollars on these beds um, just is hard to settle. Uh, so moving on to uh, enhanced treatment units on page four. 
Yes, yeah, so the governor is proposing 11.5 million from the general fund to retrofit 44 rooms within the state hospitals to create an enhanced treatment program. Essentially what this would do is create a secure space to allow patients who um, are, represent a threat to themselves other patients or staff to receive treatment at the state hospitals. The assembly approved this proposal as budgeted. The Senate also approved it, but also approved trailer bill language that would require the Department of State Hospitals to submit the policies and procedures that will guide the operation and activation of the enhanced treatment program to the legislature. We're Thank you, Mr. Soderbergh. We're in support of the Senate version, the language that's added, so. Glad to hear that. The reason for it, and you can you add to this, Mr. Soderberg, uh, appreciating your support here, mm -hmm. is that these are locked rooms. Mm -hmm. It's a nice term for locked rooms, enhanced treatment units, but the possibility, if not likelihood, mm -hmm. that those with some serious challenges in their lives are going to find themselves mm -hmm. in locked rooms and without some protocols, the need for the trailer bill exactly. and some standards, it's really solitary confinement for those with serious mental problems already. So uh, we do have a motion to take the Senate version. I, I would just note that I, I conversations are ongoing uh, around this language and we would, we're, we're definitely um, an active part of those conversations. Um, but, and we would be comfortable with um, no, a notification to the extent that it's consistent with the existing statutory parameters um, that have already been approved about how those beds will be run. Okay, uh, points well taken. Uh, just underscoring that this is placeholder mm -hmm. trailer bill language to be continued mm -hmm. uh, to be worked on. Uh, so we've got three zero on the Senate side. Mr. Chairman, one yes, question though, of course. trailer bill language is important. When will we be able to see that? Uh, we will get it to you as very soon as possible. I know the Senate, uh, the uh, request has always been for 72 hours. That's our yeah. goal. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to be able to tell you with some certainty that it won't be any less than 48 hours, but we're shooting for 72. Gotcha. Okay. 